Anyway, you'll, uh, first of all, I want to thank Ball Kim for the opportunity to, to be here today and to be on your program. Thank you very much. Second of all, thanks for coming. Uh, you had to get here a bit early to uh, be here today, so thanks very much for attending as well. You'll notice I'm going to be really nervous today because Illinois' football team has more wins than the Bears. And um, that's really bad news for both programs. We'll just leave it alone. We'll leave it alone. But all we need is one more win to be bowl eligible. And um, we'll see what happens from there. Anyway, we have a fun topic for you. Uh, ball Kim will have all these PowerPoints uh, in PDF files that you can access a bit later if you want them. So let's go. And our, uh, th our topic today is growing the right size replacements in the program. I will not be discussing the choline data because that will be following after my presentation. So let's go ahead and get, ahead and get going. And change is really happening in the heifer program. What do you mean changing? Values of heifers, costs of heifers, sex semen, beef semen, genomics. Uh, the, the list goes on and on. And so what I want to challenge you to think about is which one of these tools and which some of these numbers might you want to put in your toolbox and some of the numbers are biased. They're my numbers, but yet when you walk out that door here in another two hours, people are going to ask you what your numbers are. And so let's see where this all goes. This comes from uh, California, and the only reason I put it up here, you can see replacement costs ended up being uh, but the number two cost. Now, certainly in Pennsylvania, that might change a little bit, but it's a major investment. The heifer enterprise is a major cost on dairy farms, and until this heifer starts milking, she's kind of like having your kids at home. They're just a draw on your income. They just keep spending money, and away we go. Some interesting changes. Heifer fact. This data now is about a year old, but the point is that we have almost enough heifers to sustain a 50% cull rate. Wow, think about that. So another way to look at it is we have about 20% more heifers than we really need. And you know what those heifers are going to do? They're going to calve. They're going to calve. Anyway, think about that a little bit later. You can look down the rest of these. You can read them faster than I can. Uh, certainly my dad would certainly want to not sell a heifer to a neighbor, and that heifer turns out to be the best cow in the barn because then he knew he made a big mistake, and we would never take that chance. So we would freshen every one of them suckers out, and that's pro probably still happening as far as that goes. But certainly there is custom raising going on in large herds, including wet calves from Wisconsin going to Texas at five days of age, and we move on. So things are changing. Most of you are wearing one of these hats here today, and so I'm simply saying you'll see this slide pop up at the end, and I simply said, here are some of the things that might be in your toolbox. And we had time, we'd have you, make, have you write down by the numbers, which one of these things are you actually doing out there? And that's kind of, you can see where we're going with today's program. What are some of the things we should look at on the heifer program? And so we have to change as well. You've got to be ready to make changes up here. And you can see that my Jersey cow and I have made changes. And obviously we're in Pennsylvania and we'll move on. We'll keep moving here. Here's your first question. And that is, you know, is, uh, is that a profit center? You already know that answer. I'm going to show you the data. And, this, and there'll be more in the PDF than here because uh, I've got to be done in 40 minutes. And we got to hammer right along. So this is a survey done in 2015 by extension workers in northeast Wisconsin. So they went actually to the farms and collect the data. This is not a survey thing. They really went out and got the data. And they, they split it up into different types of operations, different counties there, and look at both calf and heifer enterprise. And they've done this now for f four different times. So that's an interesting trend. You can see where we're at in 2015. The cost, if you want to write that down, is about $2,100. And they got the whole budget. So if you want that, you can get that as well. But the whole budget's there. You can see in terms of days on feed, and the data is there as well. So that's a magic number. Write that down. About $2,100 to raise a heifer. Here comes your, your, your wet calf. And you can see the cost per day. Well, uh, if you look at all of them, somewhere it's on $5.51. That question comes up. That question comes up. A farm saying, well, if I'm going to raise Joe's calves and they're wet calves, how much should I charge Joe? And then how many of those should we be allowed to die? That would be the big question. You better have that in the contract, too, how much your death loss is going to be. Notice the, cupper, uh, the growers have a lower price. Does anybody know why that price is lower? I'll give you a, a Hershey candy kiss. Uh, those of you that are like Hershey's like I do, this is like being in heaven. Can you <laughs> just like being in heaven, milk, milk, chocolate heaven as far as that goes. And that's because they're using waste milk and they're getting it very inexpensively. 
And we have a calf grower in Illinois that go all the way up to northeast Wisconsin and pick it up because that's such a good deal for some of these big, big, bigger farms. So there's some numbers for you to look at. Here comes your heifers. And of course, those numbers vary. Pat Hoffman has a really nice table that shows that if I'm going to raise your heifers, I want to raise them when they're six months of age, not at 20 months of age. Because those suckers eat a lot of feed. They eat a lot of feed, and so the cost goes up. So you can see the cost there. You, again, you can see, uh, again, the growers do a little bit cheaper. Probably that has to do with some of the feed ingredients, the number of heifers they are raising. Interesting to take a look at. Tie stall, which would be very appropriate for you Pennsylvania folks here. Free stalls and growers. And then we go to the bottom line. And the bottom line is not going to come up here. I can see that right now. For some reason, we have a problem, Clay. I am not sure what that problem is, but uh... so here's the bottom line. So you can see over there, uh, if Clay eventually moves, which he will, there is $2,100 listed there as well. And actually you can take those, what, what would be $2,100 instead of $2,500? The heifer cost in there is 400 bucks. What are heifers, Holstein heifers selling for now? 40, 50, 60 dollars? You kind of give them away. In fact, at least in Illinois, bull calves are worth more than heifer calves, and we just leave it at that. Just leave it at that. So there's your numbers. If you look at that, and you can see how they split out, and in the PDFs, it'll, it'll break it down even, even further as far as that goes. So that's the first thing you should have written down. What is the cost? And I look at, there's a, we get a newspaper, comes out every, every week, and out here in Pennsylvania, heifers are selling for summers around $1,400. So only federal government can take and pay $2,100 and sell for $1,400. It only works in the federal government. That's supposed to be really funny. I can see politics is not playing in this meeting at all. And we'll move on. Okay, number two. What are your targets? How should these heifers be growing as far as that goes? So this is my list. It's probably not your list. But it simply says we're going to be gaining somewhere around 1.8 pounds every day from birth. From not, six, not after weaning, from birth. You know where this is going to go, don't you? Over 56 inches. And that's average. So you might want to put another two inches. That's going to be hook height or wither height. Body condition score, three to three and a quarter. We back that number down a little bit because we think there's some inherent risks with heavy heifers. We'll let you argue that a bit later. Freshening at 20 feet to 24 months of age. We want those great gals making me some money. And I want them in at 250, uh, 1,250 pound Holsteins post calving, or we jokingly say decaffeinated. <laughs> Did you folks understand that decaffeinated part here? <laughs> is this going too fast for us over here? Okay, we'll, we'll move on. And this is some old, this is some really old data, but it has a couple take home messages. It simply says that I get heifers at the right size. And you can see as we go up here, this would be a 1,000 pound Holstein heifer, yep, yep. Anyway, you can see as we get them up here, somewhere around that 1,300 pounds, and I'm pretty sure these are not decaffeinated at this point here, but at some point it levels off. So are they big enough? That's the first question. So how big do you want them to be? We'll show you some Cornell data here in just a minute. And then look over here, if you're gonna get there, at 24 months of age, big heifers, bingo. Now that's a Catholic term, you know, bingo. We move on anyway, 1.74 pounds a day if you're going to get there at 24 months of age. And that's why some of our farms, we don't get them calving in at 25, 26 months of age because they aren't pushing that type of rate of gain on farms. How many of your people are actually measuring heifers? Pretty few and far between in Illinois. Pretty few. Everybody knows their rolling herd average? But you say, what's the average data gain on your heifers? at 6, 12, 18, and 24 months of age, and kind of this blank look comes up on their face. There's some interesting data. I believe it's Cornell sourced. It simply says that certainly if you have jerseys versus average Holsteins or those big ones and from Canada that win, win at World Dairy Expo, you can see at, at breeding ages, this is 55% of this weight here, and then first, second, and third lactation. So again, what should your targets be out there in the program? Well, we're in Pennsylvania, so this is Judd Heinrich's data. And so the question is, what kind of growth patterns are you seeing? And this would be the, the average or the mean right here, and we'd like to be up in the blue line. This happens to be uh, weight expressed here. This would be uh, uh, the, uh, the 75th percentile down here. Uh, this would also come from New York State. We got all this data from New York, obviously. That would be below average. Okay, we move on. What about height? Hook height, hip height. Boy, this is a sober group. 
We should open the bar up earlier. I can see that right now. We need to have more liquor here. Anyway, and these are, these are Hope Heights as well. And so the question is, where do your farms, where do your clients fit on these various charts? And this comes out of NRC. Pretty much you can see it broken out, again, by weights. And that's kind of where we'd weigh them. They'd be my targets. What are your targets going to be? We'd like to weigh them probably at about, or measure them at 6, 12, 18, and just prior to calving. And what's the neat thing from those Canadian crooks? It says that if these animals, once they calve in, if they grow more than two inches, you didn't raise them right as heifers, because now they've got some groceries and they're going to grow. So not many of my dig areas are doing that, of measuring at calving, and then get some second, next lactation cows, and if they've grown more than two inches, we didn't grow them right in the heifer rearing program. Here's body condition scores. This comes from Penn State again. And last night I put these in red because we would not go quite that aggressive. But this is coming out of their booklet. And maybe their booklet has changed since I did it. But basically, we're going to stay right here. We're going to cut them off right here, right here. In fact, I'd cut them off even a little bit quicker here. I'd make this goal three, and then I'd go maybe three and three and a quarter. I'd tighten them right down. And we were in a couple of big heifer rear, rearing uh, ranches. And boy, they're like peas in a pod. Every one of them suckers just matched perfect. And that's another thing to take a look at when you're walking your heifers as well. So what kind of body condition score do you want? Write it down on your piece of paper, because you're going to walk some heifers. In many cases, heifers are not looked at hardly at all. Well, what are some of the things on calf feeding? And obviously, uh, Al Kurtz is here, so he should give this talk. But I'm just going to hit a couple key points here. Hopefully, he doesn't get mad at me. Uh, First of all, uh, I'm not going to give you a colostrum talk, but we all know it's awfully important. Awfully important. Dr. Drakely uses this term here. He calls it the gatekeeper. It says, if you don't get that right, then you're going to have some real challenges. How do you know if you get it right? And how many of your people are actually measuring? Actually measuring the amount of IgG being absorbed. And you might be real surprised if you start doing that. And maybe that's the only thing you write down you say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to try to measure that to see how many of these. And some people argue those numbers are a little bit low. I saw in a farm magazine those numbers might be a little bit on the low side, but that's kind of what's in there listed as well. What about these different sources of milk? To me, if you're going to feed liquid milk, I don't care if it's colostrum, waste milk, marketable milk, you will pasteurize it. You will pasteurize it, period. We can argue that over a beverage a bit later if you wish. I'm going to target 12 to 14% dry matter intake into my calves. I'll show you an example here. This is a very popular milk replacer, 2220. This is Dr. Drakeley's number calves under thermal neutrality, and we're going to start changing that here in the next couple weeks as well. And this is whole milk. Think about that. Whole milk, thermal neutral, these are proteins, of course, and excuse me, this is a fat, I'll get it right, this is fat, these are fats, and this is your, your common one as far as that goes. How many people are using milk balancers? Got any people you buying milk balancers? Got some heads nodding here, that's good. Simply says we're going to fortify some of our liquid diets, especially if it's waste milk, with some other trace minerals, macro minerals, and other goodies to make sure we aren't trying to change those calves. So again, uh, milk balancers, uh, if you Google that, you'll find um, six or seven on the marketplace as well. Certainly we can talk about common. Yep. How much powder do you got to put into two quarts of water to get that accomplished? Oh, too much. Way, way too much. Because Neil Jorgensen told me once you get over about 16 or 17 percent dry matter in a liquid product, you will have some digestive challenges as far as that goes. So it simply says you're going to have to take and get that in larger quantities as far as that goes. How much here? And here, here comes your answer in some respects. So if, if, I'm, if I'm, I'm going to get. Uh, Let's back up. I don't think I've answered your, your, your question here. Target 12 to 14% dry matter in the liquid product. But how much dry matter do we want? 2% of the calf's body weight. 2% of the calf's body weight as dry matter. So if I've got, uh, in this case up here, I've got a 90 pound uh, Holstein calf coming in there. I want 1.8 pounds of powder, and that will be in seven quarts 
of liquid. That kind of gets back, to, I think, a bit to your point there. They may not drink that all in the first week or so, but they will consume, they will consume that. I, I um, will get to the right spot here if I hit the right key. I can see how easy that is to do. Anyway, you can see what, what's happening. I'm going to stop it. I'm, I'm going to cap it there. I'm going to cap it at 1.8 pounds of solids because I want that calf to eat what? Starter. Starter. And if you go to like a veal calf, these suckers can really suck down a lot of milk. And you'll see Judd's uh, photos here in just a few minutes as far as that goes. Now, Dr. Heinrich also has some data that you can also do this when you, do, you can do with calf starter, if they will eat the calf starter. That's always my question there. And here's all the data. Dr. Drakely pulled the slide together. This is all the published data, and it simply says, here is that extra milk that you get in the next lactation. Did we hear about that in the last presentation? Yes, we did. We impact the genetics in these animals. And that's another benefit of going to this type of aggressive program. And certainly, not all calves can figure that out, but certainly the data looks pretty convincing to me. Starter intakes, well, not going to say much more about it, but I, I think you're a big fan of the texturized calf starter as well. Uh, with it, uh, how much hay a forage you put in there. I'll show you some uh, data that comes from, uh, from uh, some Spain there as well. And of course, we knew the calf starter, we need to get that for room and development. These are our guidelines, they're pretty aggressive on dry matter base. So that means my uh, starter is going to be a tagged 22. Might be a little strong for you, Al, but we'll, we've got it there, and you can follow it on down here. And the fat, interesting comments. I've got some farmers who use roasted soybeans. Anybody got roasted soybeans in their calf starters? I've got a few hands going up here, and that'll bring your fat up, and boy, they look pretty nice. We move on, we move on. Not a lot of research there to back that one up. You've all seen these PowerPoints, so we'll go through them quickly. This is from Dr. Heinrich's uh, book. And you can see these are milk-fed calves. And now we can take a look at those that receive calf starter. And I hope you can see a difference. Because if you can't see a difference, we got to go really slow. we got to really slow this program down as far as that goes. So should I feed hay or should I not feed hay as far as that goes? And certainly the concern we have is that if you offered it free choice, you're going to discover that they're gonna, they're gonna, some calves will replace starter with hay. If you look at the nutrient profile of hay versus what I just showed you here a few minutes ago, apples and oranges. Apples and oranges. Totally different as far as that goes. Five to 10% of chopped hay, processed hay or haylage with calf starters were where you'd want to be. And this comes from Dr. Drakeley from his textbook there, simply says that uh, if they're on straw and to prevent any bloating as far as that goes. This simply shows some data published in the Journal of Dairy Science showing where they have a hay with starter, a slight increase in dry matter intake, but you'll notice the hay intake is pretty modest when we, uh, until we get out here about pretty close to weaning age as far as that goes. This is the work that comes from Spain. So they said, let's let the calves vote. I understand you guys get to vote tomorrow in Pennsylvania. You have an election here in Pennsylvania. In Kentucky, they're going to look at their governor. We move on. Anyway, they, what they did here is they offered this, these products free choice. And this would be the forage. This is the concentrate. So you can see this is 8% uh, oat hay, 92% uh, concentrate. And the average daily gain, you can see that uh, statistically is one of the winners. One of the winners over here. Notice your alfalfa hay. They discovered those calves said what? Pretty palatable stuff. So we're going to eat more of that. And as a result, we replaced the concentrate. And statistically, the average daily gain went down. So you could say a small amount of hay could be beneficial. It may not have to be alfalfa. I hope the lights are going down automatically, or is it just me? Uh, it just seems like the lights are going down. But uh, anyway, more, uh, eat, have some more chocolate. That, that'll help. That'll help. So there's lots of ways of feeding hay. And I bought this, uh, borrowed this slide from Noah Leatherland. Uh, it used to be up at Minnesota. And uh, none of these look very good to me, as far as that goes. Here you can see it's right out there. So you can pick and choose here. Here you can sort the crap out of this one here, and good luck on this one over here. One farm we worked with pretty carefully, they processed the hay down, and they made a TMR out of it at about four months of age. So they made a TMR out of hay, wetted it down, 
calf starter, and I thought the calves really performed quite nicely as far as that goes as well. Well, what should these nutrient guidelines be? And so we'll race through this one pretty fast. You all have NRC books and all kinds of guidelines. Here we go. So how much dry matter will these calves eat? You can see uh, these small calves can eat, a pretty, they can eat just as much, just about aggressively on a dry matter base as a high producing dairy cow. Maybe not, not a real high producing cow, but three to three and a half percent of body weight. And you can see as they go down, they eat a lower percent of body weight, but of course the poundage, and that's what you're gonna pay for is gonna be going up. And that's why I'd like to feed these calves. I don't wanna feed these, they're gonna be too, uh, I'd like to be right down, down here as far as that goes. Here are all the numbers. So I'm not gonna walk you through them. They'll be in the PDF file, but it simply shows that uh, if you're trying to get, you know, average, a average daily gains here of these calves here, and all of them, all of them will fit this. This is pounds and kilos over here. You can see average daily gains, and you can see these, if you're gonna get up around 2.0, we're gonna either, we're gonna try to get a little more dry matter into those animals and spike them and spike them. So the question is how much dry matter, and I'll bet you a piece of pie or some Hershey Kisses, not many of your dairymen know the dry matter intakes by age of animals on farm. And boy, good luck you nutritionists, when you don't have dry matter intake, good luck in answering all these questions. Here comes your jersey tables, they come right out of NRC, no magic there. Guidelines, ours is a little more aggressive than NRC, especially on the protein side, we will see we'll have them a little bit higher here, and so otherwise pretty much straight NRC, uh, three to six, six to 12, 12 to 24. Those are our three magic rations. How many of your farms have three heifer rations? Uniquely different heifer rations. So we're saying three, and then if you want to, you, you depend on where you want to throw calf starter in there and uh, transitioning heifers, you actually have five. You actually have five rations out there uh, for, for my growing heifers. Here are the trace mineral numbers. Pretty straightforward, straight out of NRC. And uh, here you can see the different groupings we have. So you can see I got my calf starter sitting right in here from basically two weeks of age. Although I saw on the new farm program, anybody look at the farm program? You have to have uh, calf starter out there day three. Well, I'm not sure how much calf starter calves will eat at day three, but that's gonna be part of the new farm program. Interesting number. Lots of arguments I understand on that one. You can see now what happens. So here I got my calf starter and I'm gonna keep them up to three months of age because it is a good feed. It's gonna deliver nutrients. Now you say, well, I can make it cheaper. <sighs> good for you. If you can get that sold on the farm. There I go, my, here comes my heifer rations one, but notice I'm gonna split that up with different ages of animals. Here's my heifer ration two, heifer ration three, and then of course my springing heifers are sitting down there as well. I'll do some different grouping based on age differential. We'll let you decide how many months you wanna have in a given pen. You'll see we have a two month and three months there as we go along. And so you can see if you add these all up, I think I have nine groups of heifers on the farm. And I'll bet you, again, some chocolate candy kisses, you don't have too many farms that have nine groups of heifers on the farm. And we move on. So things to think about. Opportunities out there on the farm. How are we doing on time? Good, you have about 15 minutes. Holy smokers, we're gonna have to go a lot slower. Okay. Well, we're getting down to the last phase, believe it or not. But it never is a bad idea to be done early, especially when drinks and beverages are coming. You just don't want to be running late. Anyway, limit feeding of intake, control energy intake. And there appears to be two programs that are out there. This is the Pat Huffman program. Was at the University of Wisconsin-Madison up at the Marshfield Experiment Station. And what he simply says is we are going to use, we call a filler forage. So they can eat all they want, but the trick is when they start behaving like cows, we got to bulk it up, bulk it up. Kind of like dinner tonight or whatever you're serving, lots of salads, bulk it up. Don't want to eat too much of that expensive stuff. Anyway. And this could be a bit of a controversy this year. You can see good corn silage and good alfalfa. Why is that controversial in the Midwest? Man, did we have rain. Did we have rain? Did we have rain? Did we have rain? So I think we're going to have lots of heifer hay. Lots of heifer hay in Wisconsin and Minnesota and northern Illinois. It just keeps raining there. Anyway, but if you have pretty good quality forages, that's one of the problems. 
Dairy farmers have done such a good job that now we don't have these heifer feeds out there. And so we call these filler feeds. And so you can see once they start getting in the breeding pen, we start bringing in this filler feed. What's a filler feed? You know what they are, don't you? It could be straw or corn stalks, could be low quality grass, could be a legume that got uh, blessed with rain three or four times in a row, cut three weeks late. Anyway, we're going to be looking at something that's modestly low in energy here, just what I call adequate protein here, and it has some other, other characteristics as well. I'm not sure what happened here in Pennsylvania if you were as wet as we were, but we're telling our dairymen, roll up those bales of stalks. Get them rolled up because they're going to get snow here, maybe this weekend they're talking about, at least as I saw the weather report, and it's pretty tough to roll up bales of corn stalks when they got snow in them as far as that goes, but get them rolled up. You may not have to access them until next spring. Kind of late to roll them up next spring, you can do it, but the nutrient value really shifts on those crops. John Heinrich said another way you can do it, and that's limit feed. So we're going to put out X amount of feed in front of these animals, and when it's gone, it's gone. And this big Mexico farm it worked with, they had about 4,000 heifers uh, on, on, on that farm. That's what they were doing. And it was just amazing to watch. When the feed wagon came in, you talk about a stampede. Those heifers knew exactly what's going to happen. And after about three hours, it was all gone. It's all gone. So you've got to have excellent management, grouping of animals, and it can work well. Why would you want to do that? Because concentrates can be fairly economical. I'm not quite sure where we're going to go here. i to talk to Dr. Byers about that, I guess. Find out where we're at. But certainly you can limit feed high concentrate diets, and therefore you've got some other pluses that come with it as well. And you can see them listed there. You can read them at your leisure. What are some of the newer things? We wrap up. How many have seen the organic iodine data? Pretty neat stuff. Now, this is a company-driven program, and they're using the organic EDDI. Boy, that's a big word for Wisconsin Farm Boy. I'll let you folks work that through there. Organic iodine. And they're feeding 3.8 parts per million total ration dry matter. Illegal to milk cows because the iodine pops up in the milk. You can't do that. You can't do that. But they're doing it for hoof health. And we'll show you two, two of their studies that they have here. You need to get this high levels in before you start seeing the problem there. And the greatest response were in younger animals. This is one of their data sets. This is not published in-house data that they shared with us at a meeting a couple years ago. And 153 heifers, they followed them for 16 weeks. And you can see a minimum of at least 50 days on feed. And they had a significant, even with a small number, have a significant decline in the number of digital dermatitis cases. How many think this is pretty hot in the feedlots, too? Really having big impacts on the feedlot. More so there. In fact, they started out in the feedlots and said, well, if it works for feedlots, it might not work for heifers. And now we're starting to see some of these things popping up in heifers. And see, in fact, we're seeing some hoof trimming going on in older heifers as well. You can see the risk was reduced and had less problems with it. Here is the steer data. Pretty much mimics the cow data. And now they look at active lesions here. And you can see with the iodine, they had a much smaller lesion occurred here. And the number of really active lesions was significantly reduced as well, or at least a trend, depending on you, how you want to pull your stats as far as that goes. So with that, we're probably done five minutes early, maybe seven minutes early. 11, 11 minutes early. Holy smoker. Let's go back and put those ones I hid. No, I'm only kidding. So my challenge to you as nutritionists, veterinarians, consultants, feed company, whatever hat you wear here today. Number one, are you going to track the cost of raising replacement heifers? That's a tough one. That's a tough one. That's why I hide behind the Wisconsin data, and there's a new one coming out. just came out of California as well. Are you walking the heifer pins? Why would I walk heifer pins? Body condition score, looking at lameness, evidence of lameness here, here uh, looking for heifers that are poor doers. Boy, if, if an animal had a respiratory problem, the best thing you can do is sell them to somebody in New York because they never recover, according to the Wisconsin data. They never recover. If they had scours, they might recover. But if they had a respiratory disease, your best bet is to mark them and get them out rather than feed them for another two years and discover you still don't have anything that's of much value there. Culling those marginal heifers earlier, 
I'm not sure how many of your dairymen are doing genomics, but it looks to me for $45, I can find which one of my 30%, 35% heifers I want to raise. And I'll let somebody else raise them and lose money on them. I'm going to get them out at this point. Evaluate the colostrum program, and that really, in my view, that is taking the blood samples, really knowing how much failure immunity transfer is occurring on that farm. I've only been on three farms that have done it. Who's got farmers doing it? Anybody got farmers that are pulling the bloods? Good. We've got some hands going up. Fantastic. What about measuring heifers? And that's a bit of a challenge. As far as that goes, the good ones, the easiest one is when they move them from one farm to the next in the growing process, that semi has to go over scales. So they know how many, they know how, how much weight they've got on those animals as far as that goes. We already talked about growth in the second lactation. And then I'm guessing most of you aren't going to be able to do this free of charge. How do you get paid for it? How do you get paid for doing, collecting the data? And if you're doing so much an hour, it's pretty straightforward. But if it has to come through the feeding program, then you have to say, I've got to have some type of a product I'm going to sell out there in the program. And with that, I think we are done. I ran out of things to talk about. We would certainly welcome any questions, comments, arguments, clarifications that we said or shouldn't have said or said too fast. Yes, sir. Cost of raising the heifer is $2,100. Yes. And it costs $1,350 to buy a heifer. Yep. Shouldn't we be encouraging our farmers to raise less heifers so that you know, they're back in line? Great, uh, great comment. His question is, if, if it's costing $2,100 to raise a heifer and you, only, and you can buy them at $1,300 or $1,400, if you go down to New Mexico, that's exactly what those crooks are doing. Now, if you come to my elite Holstein breeder in Illinois, he will shoot you. He will shoot you. So if you've got a, a registered breeder or someone who has family lines, and obviously that's not going to play in Peoria, as we would say from there. But you're a businessman. You're probably right. Now, the question is, do you, will you get the same quality of heifer that you would have raised? That would be another question. Depends on who's got to be raising the heifer. That's right. Depends who's raising those heifers you're buying them from as far as that goes as well. So great, great, I don't think it's, a, I think it's a great comment. Now, will the price of heifers go back to $2,200, $2,400? Well, with milk price now at 20 bucks a hundred, you know what's gonna happen, don't you? It won't happen in Illinois, but every other place in the United States is only two times the increased milk production. It's when the price of milk's low and when the milk price is high. So the question is, I got a feeling we're gonna see some recovery on the heifer price. I think, it'll, I don't think we'll see it in the next six months, but I think you'll see some help. Comment? Uh, are you seeing more beef semen nowadays? Yeah, his question is, are we seeing more beef semen being used? We, we are, in fact, that will be part of our dairy winter program this year. Uh, one of the real problems, of course, according to those beef crooks, is they want a whole pot full of animals. They don't want to buy two from you and six from you. They, they want a whole pot full. And so we've had a couple of dairymen that are forming what they call syndicates which means that they're, they're, they're gonna bring these, these beef animals from six or eight different sources and they will have a very common protocol, colostrum management, or a vaccination program. In other words, they are gonna be backgrounded. So when you buy my pot load of cattle from six different people, they'll be, they'll be quote unquote health-wise the same. And if you have a respiratory problem, they would have been kicked out. Comment? How big are they? You mean these, these calves? Yeah. Well, we're going to have a discussion about that at our four state meeting this year because some people are going to move them out at, after weaning. Some are going to go to get them in the if a feeder size and then, depending where the markets are at, go all the way. And last year, my beef guy from Texas says 400 pounds, kick them out. Kick them out at 400 pounds. In other words, sell them, sell them at that point there. Because it says, you're now, if you're going to go all the way with them, you're going to take on those crooks in Nebraska and Kansas that's got 30,000 or 40,000 of them um, out, there, out there in the feedlots as far as that goes. I had another guy who said, get in now, because he's convinced the Angus people will figure this out and pretty soon there'll be a new labeling. And so your Holstein, your black Holstein cattle won't be as uh, attractive as they are now, which is what, $250, $300? And the bull calves are 50, you know, so, I mean, it's a, it's a really, really, really nice market at this stage of the game. And oh, by the way, you will have genetic base on those, on those, uh, on, on the Angus side. 
because black is not black is not black. I mean, if you believe genetics and Holsteins, the bull, uh, the, the Angus have this, that same protocol. They have criteria also getting different, different, different performance. How many guys are seeing beef semen coming in? Show him. How many guys your farmers are, are, are breeding? Typically about a bottom third. A bottom third is pretty common. Pretty common at this point. Somebody else had a comment? I do not. Al, do you have a, a level of starch in calf starter? That really depends on whether you're feeding the pellet starter with forage or uh, texturized starter. Because if you got a texturized starter, the starch level should be higher, but then you have the particle size, which causes salivation and, and uh, moderates the acidosis. If you have a high starch level in a pellet starter, you got to offset it with the forage feeding. So it really depends. So he's not going to give you a number. I can see that right now. Uh, I, you, you, we're just going to like the, just like the Democratic. Uh, we're going to pin them down. Do you, do you have a number for each of those? Do you have? No. The, the problem is, if you feed a pellet of starter by itself, you might have 45 percent starch, which is too much. You drop it down to 25 percent, you don't get the same rumen fermentation. You don't have the acidosis, but you don't have rumen dissolvent. So you have to consider all the factors when you put it together. So what about a texturized starter? A texturized starter? starter is not unusual to have 45 percent starch, and that's not a problem with a well texturized starter. And a well texturized starter means that you have somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to 60 percent of old <coughs> oats, some combination of that. So I would have backed into that and saying most calf starters are going to be about 50% corn. If corn 70, 73, 74% starch, you could say it's going to be pretty close to 40. Sure. Pretty close to 40 as far as. By the way, I knew all those answers, but I just wanted to get him involved <laughs> in the discussion as far as that. Sure <laughs> <laughs> Anything else good to cause? We probably used all our time up. We'll be around a bit later. Thanks for your kind attention. Have a good one.